Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. He has been courted heavily by the Live Golf Tour. I understand that completely. It's Nate Bauer. You know what? I just I can't take that blood money, Steve. Can't do it. I, I understand that. I'm a man, no, I'm a man a, of principle. You're a man of standards. That's right. It's all about. That's right. It's all about, you know what? It does. It does open a spot for me on the PGA. So yes, it does. Well, I'm yes. Looking forward to it. Yes, uh, Deshambo, Nah, and others are out. That's five spots that are open. I can think of right away. You're in good shape. Uh, uh, honest, the only one I'm going to miss is Phil. Honestly. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think you know, there'll be, there's a lot of fans out there going to miss him, but it's interesting that we start out by discussing money because. <laughs> That's where we're going to go to next. James did Franklin it. did meet with the media today. Did. And he talked about, and of course the topic, you know, as much as people would like to hear about Chop Robinson now being here and Deny Dennis Sutton coming in this weekend, it comes down to the money part of it. Uh, he was very uh, far more direct about it today than at any point. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think I think certainly in uh, in the context of speaking to the broader media, for sure. Uh, I, I had an interview with him uh, last week, a one on one, and it was focused entirely on NIL. Um, and he he was more forthcoming in that setting as well, I guess, than he had been previously. Um, so yeah, no, it's it is, you know, it's. It is what's happening, right? Like this, this is not this is not a conversation about. And you and I have talked about this. It's not a conversation about something that's happening down the road, like getting prepared for it. It is no. This this is here. This is happening. Uh, NIL is a massive influence on roster management and roster construction. <laughs> and if you know we're going to do one plus one equals two. That roster management and construction is what wins you or loses you games. So it's all it's all here and it's all now. And you know he's he's ready to talk about it. I think that there's a bottom line to this. You know, when you're in this business, you have to adapt. You have to. I mean, it's eleven and a half months into this. You have to adapt to it, and you have to make a decision. I think. Do you want to be a team that's in the top ten competing for the whole thing, or do you want to be twenty to thirty-five? I mean, I, I essentially get that. I think that's where he's coming from. A hundred percent. A hundred percent is. And he and he said this. He, I thought that that it was the most direct framing of the conversation that he's done in that. He, 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 somebody asked him, you know, uh, about the $13 million number, right? That's what Ryan Day at Ohio State uh, told a group of boosters it would be necessary for roster management annually, right? Like they would need to raise that amount of money. And somebody said, hey, what's, what's the number for Penn State, right? That was how it kind of started. And he said more than whatever that other number is. Without even referencing it specifically, he just said more than that. <laughs> right, and so that sets the framework. And then he, somebody followed and said, "Well, Ohio State said thirteen million dollars. You're saying that that's more than that." And and his response, I'm, again, I'm obviously I'm paraphrasing here, but his response was simply to say, "Look, every story, every year, Penn State football." is compared to Ohio State. That is the bottom line. And that's throughout the Big Ten, right? Michigan's compared to Ohio State. They are the standard of the Big Ten. And so if the number out of Ohio State is $13 million, and that's what Ohio State is saying is necessary, then why wouldn't Penn State football, if Penn State is expected to compete with Ohio State, why wouldn't Penn State football need the exact same things, right? Like, you don't have to... You don't have to duplicate exactly what someone else is doing, but you better be in the ballpark. You better be trying to do the exact same things. Uh, and, and if that concept isn't understood of what competition is, then you're going to get left behind. And I think he made that very, very plain uh, to see today. Well, it's the bottom line. You need to you need to figure out a way. How do you compete with this? Well, the current rules state that this is how you have to compete. It doesn't mean everybody has to like it. 
I mean, if you look at a lot of coaches, they don't like it, but they know, Nate, that it's their only shot. I mean, it, because that's the reality of it. James Franklin does not like it. <laughs> right? Like, you've been around him long enough. I've been yes, around I him know. long enough. I've, you know, for, for, for 10 years, 9 years now, right? I mean, from that first coach's caravan, really getting a chance to get to know James Franklin, the stories of the influence of playing, uh, you, you know, this D2 football, D3 football, uh, and and riding buses for eight hours. Like, he has this great affinity for that college football experience and what it meant to him and his life. However, however, he is trying to win football games and run a program that can compete in today's college football. And the reality, the bottom line is, what his experience was, as much as he loves it and cherishes it and has respect for it, is not what today's environment is. It's just not. And if you want to be a part of this, if you want to, if you want to have a program at Penn State that competes with Georgia, not right, like forget Ohio State. Ohio State is extremely important to this conversation, but also Georgia, Alabama, Clemson. You name it, right? Like Texas A&M, all of these programs that are making huge strides in this space and are recruiting the best players to come to their school, the reason why the best players are coming to their school is now also, right, Miami included, and these upstarts that want to be part of it, is because they have an infrastructure for NIL in place. And the sooner the Penn State fans and the sooner that the Penn State community at large starts to understand that, uh, it, you know, the, the faster you can move towards getting that established. But they're playing from behind. That's a, that's a big part of this. They are playing from behind right now, trying to catch up to those other guys. There are different ways of doing this. For example, uh, Penn State is third in the nation in endowments. Well, now I think they're looking at people saying, okay, you've done a great job with endowments. You can shift over to NIL because that's where you can really make the difference now moving forward. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, 100%, but it, it you know. <laughs> but are they willing to do it? Yeah. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is, this is in, the, in the weeds, right, Steve, for, for uh, you know, yeah. a, a sports radio show. But, like, it's. This is the core conflict, right, of, of Penn State as a community. Penn State has always done extremely well at raising money for academic pursuits, and that includes in athletics, right? Athletics having sponsored scholarships, like that endowed scholarships, that is a, a tried and true like solid thing and aspect of what Penn State athletics has been, and certainly what Penn State University has been. Uh, the, you know, look, <laughs> the conversation has to change a little bit. If if you are going to continue to maintain uh, and have a robust, healthy, strong, competitive football program, yes, those funds that may have been earmarked only for academics in the past or for scholarships in the past. It's gonna it's gonna have to be broken up. It doesn't mean that it has to swing a hundred percent the other direction, but yeah, you're you're gonna need to feed this animal to be able to compete in this space. Now let's dispel something that that some people might assume: the new TV contract yeah. will be great for the athletic department, but it is not going to help NIL, and that's something Correct. that people have to understand. That's not what it's earmarked for in every program. Correct. Correct. I mean, it's it's uh, what what see, I would but, but, say. Uh, but people will see that and they'll assume that, and you can't do that. Uh, but totally, totally is is you know if I have to look at the broader impact of television money, it's that the protection of field hockey or softball or fencing or what ha right like da down the line. If you want to have a thirty one sport athletic department and keep that going, the television money should help in that regard, in being able to maintain uh, keeping those other sports. NIL is a totally different animal, right? It, it cannot be supplied and funded by the university itself. This has to be raised through 
other means. It, I mean, honestly, it's money laundering, which is, it, it is so stupid how we've gotten to this point uh, in terms of what, the way that the NCAA structured, um, you, you know, preventing this in the first place. But now we're here. This is what it is. And so to follow legislation, right, like legally from the, the, the laws that states have in place, as well as NCAA rules, this has to be donor funded. So that can take a variety of forms, whether it's one big whale who just says, hey, I have a couple of businesses and I'm going to employ every student athlete right on the football program to be a quote unquote sponsor or in Penn State's case, appealing to the broadest set of people that you possibly can to chip in a hundred bucks a year, right? 10 bucks a month, what, what, whatever it is. Uh, however you can possibly get that slush fund, for lack of a better word, which is, right, the, the collective, however you can make that collective as robust and healthy as you possibly can, that will help you uh, engage and support NIL opportunities. There are currently, I believe, three different collectives for Penn State. Now, I talked to one of the leaders of one of them last month, and I know the goal a year from now is to be eight figures. Okay, mm-hmm. that's the goal. Got to get mm-hmm. there. Would it be important in the context of this discussion if the three collectives could just roll into one? Certainly, I think it would help. Honestly, you know, I I am not as, you know, familiar with the individual health, I would say. I think that's the best way for me to put it, of each one of those collectives. But the the programs, and again, you know, again, we're talking about this as unaffiliated collectives, right? Like, they're Mm -hmm. they're not supposed to be part of your athletic department. But right. the ones who are doing it the best know what the athletic department wants, <laughs> right? Like they know, mm-hmm. they know the structure. They know the design and how to execute and how to implement, uh, to, you know, to the best usage, right? And so, I, I, yeah, if, if, if what, whoever it is, whatever the NIL collective is at Penn State uh, that has it together, Right and and has its uh, stuff together and can execute that the best. Yeah, putting it, streamlining it and putting it into one place would seem to follow the national trends of who else is doing it the best. I should point out, I do not know the finances of two of the collectives, but I have a pretty good handle on the finances of the one. And I know eventually down the road they have to apply to be a five hundred one three c. There's just so much that goes into it. A lot of legal hoops that have to be jumped through to make this happen, but. The bottom line is, you. I mean, look. I mean, James has talked about this with me, and probably I think with you that Penn State's been fighting from behind on this since day one. What kind of impact can Patrick Kraft have on helping to close the gap? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, look. I think it's just about urgency, right? That, that that is the word. Is if you are not working towards this and improving this every day, and not looking at it as a finish line right for two years down the road they the the fact that this didn't exist from day one on july one of last year when nil became legal um put put penn state behind that's just that that is a bottom line reality Mm -hmm. is that other places were ready for this and penn state had an approach they took a different approach to lean into entrepreneurship and education that was how that was what penn state's formal institutional approach to nil was going to be but as the months played on it became very clear (laughs) that's not the tax that every other major institution and athletic department was going to take right and so now you you are looking at an environment where hey this is what everybody else has been doing and not only have they been doing it but they they've been doing it well and they've had months and months and months of practice, right? Meanwhile, Penn State's NIL, right, the the most uh, significant among them, I would say, at being Success with Honor. Yes. It launched in, Steve, what, February, March? February. February. Okay. Okay. So so you're starting that race 
from eight months behind. Seven well, months behind. Look, there, look, people can take this for whatever it means, but in today's college sports, it has what I refer to WWKD. And I think as an athletic department, you've got to maybe take this approach. What would Kentucky do? <laughs> uh, I'm, and I'm not joking when I say that. Like, if, guess what? The rules state that what they're doing is perfectly fine. Go do it. Yep. Yep. No, and it's why, and it's why, it's why Jimbo Fisher getting so upset about what Nick Saban said is so ridiculous, right? Uh, yeah. it, it's legal. This, this is above board now. And so whatever the rules are, right, as they exist today, that is what you should be getting as close to that line as you possibly can. You should be exploiting them to your fullest benefit. And not doing so means that you're not doing the things that it takes to win, that everyone else, not everyone, honestly, like there are some schools that are kind of grappling with this right now, Michigan being one of them. But if, if, if you're not doing those things, if you're not embracing it and trying to figure out a way to have as much success as you possibly can within the framework of the rules as they stand, then you're, you're, you're selling yourself short. And so I think, I mean, kind of back to your Pat Kraft question, his, the, the most important thing that I see that he'll need to do is get the full backing of the institution of Penn State in line and behind the messaging, right? Like, there yeah. needs to be a campaign. There needs to be a broad understand. however you want to do it, however you want to execute it. But it is, hey, this exists, uh, and this is how far we are behind, and this is what your help can impact the health of this endeavor, <laughs> right? Well, like, here, you got to right, make that clear, and you got to do it as soon as you possibly can. I'll phrase it this way, okay? And I'm going to ask you one quick basketball question. The rules are the rules as they stand. He needs Penn State, and Penn Staters to all pull in the same direction. All yep. right? Yep. That's what it comes down to. I think that's probably the, the, the simplest way to phrase it. Uh, Mikey Hen is, uh, is in... I don't even think he visited campus. He did uh, not. <laughs> six six eight wing. Uh, what kind of impact could he have? Um, you, you know, I think that it's important to set the right expectations. He's a, he's a big body, right? Which uh, Michael Shrewsbury and Penn State didn't have, and so immediately he gives you uh, that, right? He, he gives you a little bit of size. I think right. that. At 225 pounds, you know, expecting a ton, right? Like, we're not talking about a rim protector here. Uh, no, defensive, no, no. Defensively, what he brings you is going is gonna to be uh, complex, complicated. <laughs> right? like it's going mm-hmm. to be tough for him, I think, in the Big Ten to guard fives. However, he's, he's really a stretch, right? I mean, he shoots it. He, I think he hits 38% from three. Um, you know, he, he's smart. He, he knows the game. And I think from – I was able to talk to him actually right after he committed. Um, you, you know, kind of what Penn State envisions for him is, you know, a lot of the offense that Shrewsbury ran last year was through John out of the high post. And right. so to be able to bring that element back and to be able to have that in your arsenal I think helps. I think it's something his passing is something that he attributed uh, as being one of his better qualities, you know, so offensively, you know, um, maybe it's not unreasonable to think, I don't know, 12 12 to 15 minutes a game, maybe, maybe five. That's what I thought. Right. Five point, eight point. Yeah. I I said 15 to 20 and uh, a contributor that will help you win some games, but he's not the swing piece that changes the whole program. Yeah, I, I I mean I think that the important caveat to this is it 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 relaxes the pressure and the timeline on the true freshman exactly. because with them coming in and not having a, right a big body anybody literally over what that's six 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 five I mean right. yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't have a body on the roster 
over six foot five or six foot six. Um, and so for to, you know to bring in this six eight kid, uh, I think relaxes a little bit the pressure that those guys would have felt trying to get up to speed and be immediate contributors, um, you know, in the non-conference schedule. Yeah. Nate, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Appreciate it very much. Thanks so much for having me.